Okay, today we're starting out in Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and as usual, I'm, I've drifted off to, to somewhere else, several other places, but okay, first of all, Acts 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the main thing I'm going to focus on today is being a witness for Jesus, letting people get a glimpse of Jesus in us, because these are the last instructions Jesus gave to his followers. If you are a saved person, then these instructions are for you. We are to be witnesses about him, for him, of him. Our lives should manifest Jesus to this world. We should allow others to get a little glimpse of Jesus in us. That's our main business to be about. That's why we're left here after we're saved. That's why we've had some close encounters with death. Some of us don't even know we did, but I'm sure we have. We've had some close encounters with death when Satan wanted us to die. He wanted to get rid of us, but God stepped in and saved us because he still has a purpose here for us. Last instructions are very important. These were the last instructions of Jesus to us. He was saying to us today as well as to those on the day he left, you have power in you to be all you are meant to be. Above all, be a witness for me. Help others to know about me. Sometimes these instructions are hard to keep because... Those we encounter are sometimes uh, the ones that most need to see Jesus, and sometimes these, the furthest away from Jesus, that need to see him the most are the meanest, most stubborn, most unreasonable, and hateful people we'll ever meet up with. And, uh, you know, I wonder why God does that to us. <laughs> they need to see Jesus. They need, they need to see Jesus. Are you going to feel fill your purpose for being here it's an opportunity it's then to them most of all that we christians should rise to the occasion and not stoop to the level their own i read this morning also psalms 34 verse 1 I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Dr. Peter Ruckman's comment on that verse was, magnify him, that is, enlarge his glory and increase his size in the sight of the heathen. Beside that comment, I wrote, rise up, don't stoop to their level. Don't act in such a way that it's hard to tell who the heathen is and who the Christian is. While doing this study, an incident came to my mind, which happened lately, where there was much disputing between some uh, teenage boys and, and a, a man that should have acted more like a man, but <laughs> these young men, I believed, are saved people. I know them. I believe they're saved. But if anyone had been witnessing the episode, they would have thought they were all heathens. <laughs> so if we are to be witnesses, and we are, then if a person is acting like a pagan, don't act like a pagan with them. Baby Christians and even sometimes mature Christians fall way, way short of being all that God has called us to be at times like this. I've fallen way short. A lot of people have. But when we goof up, and most of us know when we do, just get back up, keep going. You'll have... <laughs> plenty of opportunities in this world to practice to get it right might be 
we Christians should not act like a fool with whoever it is acting like a fool. We should not look like a pagan with him, if that's what he's looking like. That's how he's acting. Um, if we have something that needs to be said to a foolish person, we can say it, but we can say it firmly, and we can speak the truth in love. Read through Matthew's book. See how Jesus dealt with ignorant people. He spoke the truth in love. He spoke it firmly, and he didn't hang around to argue it. When you speak the truth, there's no need to debate it. Jesus said what he had to say, and then if it wasn't accepted, he departed. He went somewhere else, to other places, to other people who would accept his words. Let me say that again. When we have the truth on our side, it doesn't have to be debated. It doesn't have to be argued. We can speak it and leave it. Don't altercate, vacate. Now, there were a couple of very interesting things that happened during his ministry that may surprise people who don't read the Bible. Those uh, people who think, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? He would love, 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 and accept everyone with open arms just as they are. He would accept everything, but no... Um, that is not what Jesus would do. When you read the Bible, you'll see that. Love is not a meek and wimpy thing like the world may think of it as being. Twice, Jesus drove money changers and their animals out of the temple. He poured out, he, he didn't just say, y'all need to leave now, I love y'all, but y'all need to leave now. No. Nah. He poured out the money changers' coins and he turned their tables over. <laughs> he told them to get. The first time this happened was in John chapter 2. Uh, after, uh, okay, John 2 12 through 16, we'll read it. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. His brothers were there too. His brothers were not believers at that time. They didn't become uh, saved people until after the resurrection. But anyway, his mother and his brothers and his disciples uh, went down to Capernaum. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, that's a whip. When he made a whip, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. Can you imagine that scene? I would have loved to see the look on the disciples' face. And his brothers probably thought, man, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> uh, especially this first time he did it. Can you imagine? The disciples had just started following Jesus. I bet they had second thoughts about hanging around this guy. <laughs> but uh, that, that first time in John was near the first of his ministry. The same thing happened again near the end of his ministry in Matthew 21, 12 through 13. This time he threw their chairs over too. Was it okay for Jesus to act like that? Sure it was. In Matthew 21, he called the temple my house. Jesus is God in flesh. God can do and act any way he wants to, and it's always the right way. It was his house, his property, the same way the body of the born-again believer is the property of Jesus Christ. And you know what? He has the right to tell us how to take care of this body. This body is his temple today. When Jesus was running the money changers out of the temple, 
he didn't spout out a bunch of heathen profanities while he was getting them off his property. He did it in a way that those standing around got the message and knew Jesus was completely in charge and completely right in what he did. And when we have to take a stand for truth, we can do it like Jesus did. Then the truth we're trying to make known comes across in a way that can better be grasped. It can come across in a much more effective way than if we're acting like a bunch of heathen with the heathens. Now, I'm not saying you can't be firm. Jesus was. I'm saying be firm, stand your ground, but keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 24. Keep your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. Matthew 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's why you got to guard it. What comes out of our mouth is what we're letting get in our heart. What we allow to enter our hearts will be expressed sooner or later in our words, in our lives, our actions, and the ignorant profanities the world uses should not be something we are letting into our heart, no matter how much we have to hear it. And by the way, we shouldn't hear it on purpose. When we know a TV show is full of profanities, we don't have to watch it. I would have loved to have watched Yellowstone, but that first episode, oh my, ah, uh, it was horrible. Now, I will admit, I've gotten hooked on some where it wasn't bad at first, and I got to watching it and involved in the storyline, and man, my temptation just gave way. I continued once they, even once they started their vulgarities, but, you know, <laughs> Yellowstone, mm -mm. now I'm not judging y'all that did it, but I just, I couldn't watch it. But it is coming on CBS, so let me go on with this and get off of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the ignorant profanities the world uses should not be something we are letting into our heart. We shouldn't let it into our heart. And it's hard to listen to it all the time and not let it into our heart. And that's why I'm saying don't listen to it on purpose, you know. Our co-workers and, and whoever, sometimes we, uh, we can't help but have to hear them, but, but we can turn the TV off. Okay, King David, he was a pretty tough guy. Even when he was just a little shepherd boy, he was a tough guy. And the words from his mouth were, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David was no wimp. He was a fighter. He was a warrior. So much so that even though he wanted to be the one to build the first temple, God didn't allow it because of the blood that was on his hands from all the wars he had fought. But David was still called by God a man after mine own heart. So what I'm saying is you can be firm when needed, but still let the words that come out of your mouth be an expression of Jesus in your heart. Your words then will be with authority and will be much more effective. Even if you have to fight, you don't have to say the words that would come across to others so that they would think all of these people are a bunch of pagans. Not if you keep Jesus in your heart. Standing your ground, yeah. <laughs> Hey, it may even mean knocking someone to the ground. If you have to do it, do it in a spirit of love. They may be in a desperate need for that kind of lesson. Who knows? <laughs> of course, Romans twelve eighteen is something you should always keep in mind. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. But Christians are sometimes called to fight physically when necessary. And there's nothing wrong with fighting to protect the innocent or to defend one's home, one's family, or one's country. All Christians are always called to fight spiritually. We're all warriors. We're in God's army. God provides the armor 
Ephesians chapter 6. If we're keeping our spiritual armor on, what comes out of our mouth won't be a problem because it's going to reflect what we've been putting in our heart. If you've goofed up, we all have. If you've goofed up along the way and said the wrong things, there'll be plenty more opportunities to get it right. (laughs) You'll have plenty more practice. As long as you're in this world, you're going to have practice getting it right. Until that time, the prayer David said would be a good one for us to pray to. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. God bless you on this journey called life. It is a marvelous thing to have been blessed with.